Let's go talk about this gun. This is a Model 12 Remington 22 pump. Model 12C actually. C over at the bench. Welcome back. Well, the rifle I was just shooting is this uh, rather old. This is an antique Model 12C Remington 22 pump. And um, as you can see here, it's got the uh, old steel crescent butt plate and uh, octagon, 24 inch octagon barrel with tubular feed. And this, will, this, this model here will accept shorts, longs, and long rifles interchangeably. And it's a takedown model. Uh, before we sit down and talk about this gun, let's just do that. Let's take it down and uh, show you how you clean this one up. Let's step over the bench. Now, as with many takedown 22s of the era, uh, this has a very simple thumb nut on the uh, left side, and simply unscrew that. Now, there's e even though there's a slot here, uh, this should never be uh, tightened with a screwdriver. It's actually dished out that you can use a, a coin, a penny, or or nickel, whatever fits in there, but frankly you don't need to have anything. There's no reason to tighten that up other than just finger tight. Uh, in other words, screw it down and just just tighten it, just thumb tight. That's all you need to do. Uh, there's no reason to uh, exert any force on that. And so many so many guns are damaged by people uh, using pliers or, or uh, screwdrivers on that uh, thumb nut. So once you've got that done, keep it tipped in this direction here so it doesn't fall back inside the hole. This is a captured uh, this is a captured bolt so that it won't fall out. But leave it in this direction here. And I have already cleared this gun and made sure that it's uh, completely empty. Uh, now just pull it straight straight to the rear. See if I can keep the keep my arm out of the way. And it separates down into two parts just like that. Two major components I should say assemblies and uh, this is your hammer here you can you can drop that hammer uh, to clean around it uh, very easily and uh, before you put it back together again it must be cocked in the rearward position and I suggest you put the safety on so that it doesn't accidentally fall you can see it's a very massive hammer a uh, very very uh, wide broad hammer and uh, it also has this is the lifter that carries the cartridge from the magazine. Now in this in this end here, this is the uh, receiver and barrel assembly. Uh, you can see it's quite complex inside. Um, this this entire mechanism, I'll talk about this uh, and its designer. Uh, this mechanism is probably one of the most complex uh, in all of firearms, especially for 22s. Um, and I'll show you how to how to simply take that apart uh, so you can remove the bolt for uh, breech end cleaning. So you can this this rifle, as with many breakdown takedown 22s, you can very easily uh, clean it from the breech as you should. Now you'll see this you'll see this little detent right here. There's a there's a silver button right behind the uh, for the fore end grip that presses down under thumb pressure bring the fore end to the rear while at the same time pushing down with your thumb so that it slides underneath the lower part of the receiver and slide it all the way to the rear now at this time lift up lift up on the rear of the bolt as you push the fore end back to the front and as you do that you'll retain you'll retain the bolt in your fingers here and you can move the uh, slide forward and and easily clean out the receiver and clean out the uh, barrel so once we've done that you can go ahead and clean out the breech face we'll uh, we'll get that done here i'm not going to go through a whole process of cleaning uh, this is a fairly straightforward procedure. Um, this rifle here uh, has got some uh, serious, uh, owing to the corrosive ammo that was used back in the time when this rifle was made, this, this gun has got some fairly serious uh, pitting in the bore and in the uh, chamber. So 
I've actually got to uh, I've actually got to keep uh, this very very clean in order for it to uh, uh, cycle properly. Otherwise, cartridge cases, brass cases, will uh, seize themselves in the chamber after firing, and the uh, ejector, the uh, extractor claw, will not pull the case out. So I've got to actually. Uh, pry them out with a screwdriver. So I've got to be very, very careful to make sure that this gun is kept meticulously clean. Now once you've got all assemblies cleaned out and you've got your bolt clean and the receiver and barrel assembly cleaned out, re the reverse order is uh, all you need to do in order to uh, reassemble it. But be sure that the slide is first of all kept in the forward position. Uh, slide the the bolt in until it just drops down into its recess. You can see that you can see that cutaway in the uh, you should be able to see that cutaway up inside the circular area right here. It's actually dropping down into that cutaway. So just slide it in until you hear that drop down in and it secures itself. You, you can you can tell right here. Once it's in that position, you're ready to slide the fore end back. Again, depressing that silver button and sliding it underneath. At this time now, it's important to uh, lift up on that bolt a little bit, and as you slide that forend, once it's, once it's captured, uh, you're golden, then it's already in. So all you need to do is just lift that rear end up just a tiny bit, just a fraction of an inch, and that will allow the uh, claw, the machined claw on the back of the uh, slide to grab hold of it. Now you may have noticed something here. As I slide this, as I slide this bolt to the rear, the slide to the rear, that entire magazine tube is sliding along with it. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, design feature. This entire feed mechanism, the uh, entire magazine, uh, this end is sliding back and forth and actuating with the bolt. So now we're, gonna, we're just going to put it back together with the slide all the way forward, uh, place the, making sure the hammer is cocked, place the receiver in, and make sure that the front end is, there's a little, dove, there's a little uh, dovetail here, there's a little tang, that has to go underneath there's a slot for it. Make sure this is flush on all sides and just simply push it together. Once you've got it, once you've got it so that it's flush all around and toward the back, then you can go ahead and remount this screw. And you're back in business. So that's how you take down this Remington Model 12. Now this this same procedure applies to the Model 12C which is a target model or the standard Model 12 and it came in many different variations that we'll talk about. So let's uh, go over to the uh, chair and sit down and relax and uh, discuss this uh, fine gun. So here we are. It's a beautiful gun. Very very nice handling rifle. All steel and uh, Again, this is the model 12C. 12C meant target model. That was a designation for the so-called target model. Now, the model 12 was made in uh, a number of variations, um, and later on it had a standard, you know, square butt. Most of the uh, model 12s did not have a pistol grip. They were straight. They were straight gripped, straight stocked, uh, all the way, and uh, they had. They had various uh, chamberings. They had uh, this one here happens to be short, long, and long rifle. Uh, but they also made uh, short gallery models, and uh, they made them in uh, 22 and 24 inch barrel lengths, both round and octagon. And they could be had uh, with checkering. Uh, they had a um, they had a uh, basically it was an open market for for uh, modifications, you could specify exactly what you wanted if you had enough money. Um, there was a $45 uh, Premier model that uh, had uh, elaborate engraving on the receiver on both sides. And um, 
When these guns first came out in 1909, they were selling for, uh, the standard model was selling for $12.65, which was a chunk of change back in 1909. Uh, you know, gun values pretty much represent the same, the same cost uh, to the individual uh, throughout time. Uh, they, they have pretty much uh, kept pace with uh, the, all the inflation that has gone on through the years. Um, and the, um, the highest grade model was $45 at that time. They were made until, from, from 1909, they were made until 1936, which would have been right dead square in the middle of the uh, Great Depression, the Great Depression beginning in 1929. Now a lot of firearms, uh, a lot of firearms manufacturers were having difficulty uh, peddling guns during those uh, lean years. Uh, when the entire country was uh, basically suffering from uh, that that depression, financial uh, financial depression that uh, really buried people uh, into uh, debt and uh, people lost their homes and things. And sometimes, sometimes owning a firearm uh, was really the last the last possible thing that you could uh, afford after you bought your bread and soup. So. These guns went out of production after 1936. Uh, there were uh, 831,759 made, uh, serial number from uh, uh, number one up to that last number. And um, as far as I'm aware, they were made sequentially. This, this rifle right here is numbered 455,667. Uh, so it's somewhere around a little, little beyond the middling point. Um, the best I can tell, this rifle was made sometime before 1921, probably around 1918, 1919, or something like that. Uh, it's an old one, and as I told you before uh, at the bench, the, uh, the barrel, the rifling is still there, and the accuracy is still pretty good, uh, but it's pitted sufficiently so that uh, it causes extraction problems if I don't really keep the uh, chamber clean. Um, the gun was designed by John Pedersen, who had a, a long-standing relationship with the Remington factory. He really only, uh, his only association through the years was with Remington on a uh, professional basis. He was Remington's uh, designer for uh, a few different uh, firearms, and notably this one here. Um, Pedersen is also known for the Pedersen device, which was uh, designed for uh, to be used during the uh, First World War. The Pedersen device replaced the uh, bolt on a 306 uh, rifle and um, converted it basically with a very short chamber that was the length of the uh, the length of the 3006 cartridge. Uh, it converted it to a 30 caliber, uh, very light bullet. I think it was an 85 grain or 86 grain bullet or something like that. And 30 caliber, uh, relatively low velocity, only about 1300 and something feet per second. And that was supposed to be used, uh, That somebody had dreamed up the idea that that would be used in trench warfare. It had an ungainly a long magazine, stacked magazine, that I believe held 45 rounds, and there were counting windows in the back of the magazine. But you can imagine that a magazine sticking out, it was a, it was a fairly, fairly small diameter magazine uh, that that would be very easily bumped into in, the, in, the, uh, in a combat situation. So, but Pedersen uh, was noted for that design and also for the Pedersen uh, 380 pistol and a few 32, uh, 32 caliber pistols also made in the uh, Patterson pistol. Most of them were 380 uh, that Remington made, and uh, which stands apart from the more recent uh, reintroduction of the Remington uh, so-called Patterson pistol because Remington made some modifications to it that uh, didn't didn't operate uh, all that well, but. Um, so Pedersen had, uh, he had that association with Remington that uh, lasted for a number of years. He's somewhat of a controversial, uh, controversial uh, gun designer. 
Now, General Julian Hatcher, of great renown, he's uh, the person that uh, had, he was the authority on uh, ballistics during the era of World War II, especially, and, and uh, the following the years following and, the, and through the 50s. And, um, he, had, um, he had great knowledge of uh, firearms, uh, especially military firearms and things. And um, he had, uh, you know, he had rubbed elbows with uh, uh, John Browning. And uh, John Moses Browning had, according to uh, General Julian Hatcher, uh, had declared Pedersen to be uh, the, the most brilliant uh, firearm designer uh, who ever lived. Well, that might, that might be, that might be uh, probably an act of humility on the part of John Browning because we know that John Browning's uh, renowned in the field of uh, firearms design uh, is unparalleled. There's absolutely, there's absolutely nobody that even comes close to uh, his, uh, the number of designs that have remained successful down through the years, which includes uh, the, the win, you know, improving all the Winchester uh, lever action rifles you know the, the the model 94 it was a john browning design and the model 92 was uh the model 1911 pistol was uh and the the, the 50 caliber browning uh, machine gun was uh, it goes on and on and on uh you know and and most of his, his designs are, have stood the test of time and are still being used in one form or another and if they're not actual, actually Browning designs, most fire, many firearms incorporate his design features, uh, the things to, that he originally cooked up, such as, for instance, the, uh, the uh, camming barrel on the back of a uh, 1911, the cams into the, the, cams into the uh, top of the receiver. Uh, that's, that's a design feature which is used on uh, it's a, that, that, dropping, that dropping barrel. Uh, that's a design feature which is used on virtually all uh, semi-automatic uh, pistols. So anyway, I digress. John Pedersen uh, seemed to have a knack for uh, the complex. I, I don't. He didn't. He didn't seem to belong to the uh, Kiss Club. What was Kiss? Kiss stands for keep it. Keep, keep it simple, silly, something like that. Uh, so anyway, he didn't belong to that club. Um, as I showed you, this, this rifle here, uh, in order to uh, bring the bolt to the rear, the entire, the entire magazine uh, cycles along with it. You might say, well, why doesn't he just have the, the slide connected with, act, with an action bar that slides the bolt back and forth uh, very uh, simply? It's a good question. And that's the reason why, you know, as much as I, as much as I appreciate this rifle, um, this rifle has had, uh, it's, it's had its adherents, and it's, it's also had its uh, ob objectors. There are, there are people, including me, this is my rifle. I bought this at, a, uh, I bought this at an auction not too long ago, um, and I, I, got a, I got a pretty good, pretty good uh, buy on it. Not too bad, but it was a local auction. Um, but you know, I'd be one of the people who would not necessarily be. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be shining praise on the uh, mechanical aspects of this firearm. It's way, way, way too complicated. Um, you know, I, I, I'm very well versed in firearms, and uh, you know, anytime I see intricate design, you know, what what you'd call fine-tuned uh, actions. Fine-tuned is like a, a fine-tuned Steinway piano. Once it's out of tune, it sounds just as bad as any uh, honky-tonk piano. So, you know, that's, that's some of the issue that this gun has had. Um, when I first got it, I had to uh, basically had to rebuild the uh, bolt because the bolt, the bolt had suffered some uh, issues where uh, it wasn't, it wasn't um, extracting and feeding properly. And if you go online, you're going to find uh, quite a number of people who are asking questions about how to improve or how to fix a feeding issue with a Model 12. That seems to be that seems to be a very very common issue. Now, 
for those who have uh, a Model 12 that uh, that operates fine, they'll you know they'll shoot it all day long and have absolutely no issues with it, and they love them, and and for good reason. It, it's just as good a shooting rifle as there ever was made, uh, and they're they're beefy. You know this is this is a this is a hefty uh, all steel gun, um, but you know again it's not it's it's it's. Uh, I don't know why he had uh, this uh, inclination to uh, design, to over-engineer things, but he did. Uh, it's a very, very difficult gun to uh, disassemble and to put back together again. There's a lot of intricacies. There are a lot of screws that don't necessarily have to be there if you were, if you were designing from another uh, viewpoint. It's possible that in that era, we know that, we know that the uh, Model 61 Winchester had not yet come out uh, when this was out. The Model 61 Winchester came out in 1932, and you saw that in my Christmas video. Um, I consider that to be uh, I, I consider that to be a more elegant gun in terms of simplicity. You know, it it has a simple action bar. The the bolt the bolt slides back and forth uh, gracefully. Uh, it's a very simple gun. The feeding mechanism is extremely simple. And you know it's it's a stalwart type of mechanism that uh, won't go away because it, it's it's simple to produce. Um, this one here has got an extremely uh, complex design. Even the even the the bolt release is this complex mechanism underneath here. There's a lot of machine work in this. Tremendous amount of machine work. Uh, I mean that's that's a testament to uh, John Pedersen's genius. There's no, absolutely no question about it. John Browning was correct when he said that, uh, you know, he was a, he was a firearm genius. Absolutely. But, you know, sometimes genius also means, you know, keeping things simple. Uh, because when it came right down to it, Pedersen had a difficult time selling his product, except for the Pedersen device, which he sold in great numbers to the uh, military. And virtually all of those, uh, all of those devices were uh, subsequently destroyed by the military uh, because they were never placed into service during World War I. And there were some that were, I mean, frankly, they were stolen. Uh, and that's why we have a few still around, because uh, some people just pocketed them and, and kept them before they, uh, before they were, were destroyed. There's somewhere probably around 100 or so, they figure. But um, he had a difficult time uh, selling his product to, any, uh, to anybody because because of the complexities, um, his uh, his his pistol it his uh, pistol that he offered to the government after the 1911 uh, Browning design had been uh, placed into service, um, it was uh, it was panned. Uh, the government didn't want it, and they they made a number of they they said a, stated a number of reasons why. Uh, they said that well, they already have they already have a pistol in service, and there's no sense in replacing that. And I, I'm sure that there's some truth to that. But uh, if you look at the actual components that are in that uh, pistol and compare them to the 1911, you know, for a guy in the field, you know, the idea the idea for a uh, uh, you know soldier in the field is uh, to be able to take a take a gun apart, you know, on his uh, sleeping bag in the dark and put it back together again without having to worry about small parts and springs and all that stuff. And the 1911 makes it about as simple as you can get. Uh, you don't want to make it any more complex than that. Well, that's where that's that's where this one here uh, kind of I, I I would say this design met its Waterloo, is uh, with its with its design uh, complexity. So I I suspect that Remington probably couldn't keep up with uh, the uh, Winchester uh, competition with the Model 61 that was introduced just. Uh, in 1932, so that by 1936, between the Depression and probably the, their arch competition with Winchester, uh, this was phased out. And uh, I shouldn't say phased out, it was just simply canceled. So, what do I think about the rifle? Well, the action, the action is, 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 is smooth, um, but it's tighter and it's heavier than uh, most pumps ought to be, and that owes again to the fact that you're sliding a lot more material back and forth. There's, there's a lot of hardware going back and forth, and you know, anytime you, anytime you add weight to uh, 
to a mechanism, you're increasing you're increasing the um, the weight of the uh, the stroke. So it's okay. Um, you know, it's a fun it's a fun rifle to shoot. And if you and if you happen to come up with if you happen to come up with one of these that's uh, functioning, make sure before you buy one of these, if you can have a chance to uh, shoot it. That's that's well advised because uh, these are known to have uh, some issues, and there aren't too many people around these days that can, uh, you know, manufacture parts if they need to be remanufactured for this rifle, and uh, they're long out of production, and uh, you know there aren't there aren't any spare parts around unless you happen to have a parts gun that you can swap out. So. So that's it. Um, it's a great little rifle. Um, this is this was. Obviously, it's been around a long time. I would say this has been around uh, for the better part of a hundred years, um, and uh, it's probably going to be around for a lot longer. I, I would say that uh, this is probably a candidate to having it re-sleeved if it could be done uh, by somebody who knows the knows is very skilled at it. That would be to uh, there's Benny, there's my buddy. Hi, are you going to? Uh, you can't. Oh yeah, he's a good boy. He just was out. He was just out shopping, I guess, with mom. He loves to go uh, for a ride. So, uh, and he's doing super good. He's doing really awesome. So he likes to come downstairs here with dad and talk about guns, huh? So where was I? Um, yeah, it would be a it would be an excellent gun to have uh, sleeved. What's that? Uh, in other words, the, the barrel would be bored out uh, and a, a liner would be uh, silver soldered in place. And that would probably make this rifle into a very, very fine shooter. Uh, that may be something that I could consider doing. Um, because it is a nuisance to have, to have every now and then cartridges, uh, empties get hung up in the chamber and then it double feeds. One's trying to go into the chamber that's uh, occupied by a uh, spent case. So uh, that's it. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Uh, hit the little bell so that uh, you can be notified of uh, any upcoming videos. I have a few planned. So uh, take care and God bless.